No other king could vanquish the war horse or silence the warrior's rage while riding the lowly back of a donkey. No other king could break the dominion of darkness, the tyranny of evil, with a reign of grace and a kingdom of peace. No other king could give his life for the redemption of rebels, his wealth to welcome the outcast. Jesus is that king, the king of glory, son of the living God. Not just another king, not just another prophet, not just another teacher. He was the one the world had been waiting for, the one to deliver us from captivity, the son of David and Abraham's chosen seed. He is the goal of the Mosaic law, Yahweh in the flesh. He is the one to establish God's reign and rule, to heal the sick, give sight to the blind, freedom to the prisoners, and proclaim good news to the poor. This Jesus was the creator come to earth and the beginning of a new creation. He embodied the covenant, fulfilled the commandments, and reversed the curse. This Jesus is the Christ that God spoke of to the serpent, the one prefigured to Noah in the flood, the one promised to Abraham, the one guaranteed to Moses before he died, the one promised to David during his reign, the one revealed to Isaiah as a suffering servant, the one predicted through the prophets and prepared for through John the Baptist. He is the Father's Son, Savior of the world, and substitute for our sins. More loving, more holy, and more wonderfully terrifying than we ever thought possible. He is our Jesus, and there is no other king like him. He is our God, our glory, our victorious Savior. There is no other king like him. There is no other king.
Hello, family. Uh, happy Easter morning. It is wonderful for, for us to gather together, although we are distanced. Short distances, long distances, we are distanced, but we are not distanced from the presence of our resurrected Lord. He is among us, He is with us, and He reigns and rules every circumstance and situation because the stone was rolled away long time ago. Luke chapter 24 verses 1 to 6 records this and let me read that to you. But very early on Sunday morning, the women went into the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. They found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. So they went in, but they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. As they stood there puzzled, two men suddenly appeared to them, clothed in dazzling robes. The women were terrified and bowed with their faces to the ground. Then the men asked, Why are you looking among the dead for someone who is alive? He isn't here. He is risen from the dead. Remember what he told you back in Galilee? So here is the passage, the uh, a wonderful uh, story of our resurrected Lord. Death could not hold him. They killed him, but, but death could not hold him. The grave could not hold him. The huge stone was rolled away by the resurrection power of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, he arose. The tomb was empty. I remember when I went to Israel and we went to that tomb and I couldn't find Jesus there. Why? Because the tomb is still empty. No one has ever risen, been, risen, has risen from the dead like Jesus. Rome could not hold him in the grave. Nor could the dogmatic Jewish leaders like the Pharisees, the scribes, the Sadducees, they could not hold him. They would have wanted to. They wanted to prove that he did not rise from the dead. They put officers, they, they sealed the tombstone, but nothing could hold Jesus behind because the power of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ came upon it and the stone was rolled away. Yes, the Lord uh, the risen Lord wants to roll away every stone in our lives as well. You know, we all have stones in our lives that need to be moved away. They're hard and strong and they're keeping us in, in grave clothes. But the Lord is wanting to come in his resurrection power. Uh, the resurrection power of our Lord Jesus Christ uh, rolled away the stone of fear which terrified the uh, followers of our Lord. If we could invite our resurrected Lord into our lives, he will roll away the stones of fear and intimidation in our lives. The, the disciples, uh, and the followers of our Lord at that time were in fear because they, were, they feared the Romans that they would come and arrest them and cause trouble, chaos. But, but uh, the Lord uh, gave them the freedom and the fear the, the stone of fear rolled away. The, then the angel spoke to the women. Don't be afraid, he said. I know you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He isn't here. He is risen from the dead. Just as he said would happen. Come and see where the body was lying. The angels in Matthew chapter 28, 5 and 6 uh, guided the women to the place where Jesus lay. And, and you know, the, the, the stone of fear, there are many of us who have stones of fear, very specially at this time and season when people are suffering and all kinds of things are happening globally. This is a global phenomenon. Everybody is under fear today. But to us who, who believe in the resurrected Lord, Jesus Christ. He has come and rolled away the stone of fear. Has he rolled away the stone of fear in your heart? Come on, ask Jesus to come. Ask his, his resurrected presence to come and fill your heart and roll away every fear and that you would be able to rejoice without suspicion that the Lord is living and alive. Secondly, the stone of doubt and disbelief. 
none of his disciples could believe when they heard the news that Jesus had risen from the dead. The lost, uh, the, the lost to believe of Jesus, that Jesus' resurrection was Thomas. The last to believe of Jesus' res resurrection was Thomas. His reaction to the message of Jesus' resurrection was, I won't believe it until I see the nail wounds in his hands. Put my fingers into, into them and place my hand into the wound in his side. Eight days later, it says, uh, the disciples were together again. And this time, Thomas was with them. The doors were locked, but suddenly, as before, Jesus was standing among them. Peace be with you, he said. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and look at my hands. Put your hand into the wound. Put, put your hand into the wound in my side. Don't be faithless any longer. Believe my Lord. My Lord and my God was Thomas's expression. Then Thomas exclaimed, oh, oh, oh. What a what what terrible thing have I done? I have be, disbelieved you. The resurrected Lord, the resurrected Lord, rolled away the stone of doubt and disbelief in Thomas's heart. How about you this morning? Do you have fears about your future and lots of doubt? Wonder what are we going to do? How how is the economy going to be? What are the jobs job opportunities? What are the openings that I would have? How can I rebuild everything that I've lost? Everything probably has shaken around you. You know, many things are shaking around and many people of the world, they are beginning to realize that the money that they had and all the stuff is of no worth and value. Only Jesus, the resurrected Lord, let Jesus come into this situation in your life and drive away that doubt from your heart. Fear and doubt. And, and those stones, if you allow the Lord to, to come and reign and rule in your heart, He will roll away those stones. They are big, they are heavy, they are impossible humanly, but God can come by the resurrected power of our Lord and, and cause that stone to roll away. And the third, and the third stone, let's look at the stone of death and sorrow. They were in great sorrow because of the death. And and, and although Jesus said uh, on the last day, on the third day, I will rise again, these people were in so much sorrow and of death because uh, uh, they couldn't believe. And Jesus, Jesus arose from the dead and he came. And, and, and today Jesus wants, to, wants us to experience, you know, the, 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 the joy uh, that uh, his resurrection power brings into our lives. Jesus, through his power of resurrection, rolled away the stone of death and sorrow by overcoming death. He has provided the victory and has given us an eternal consolation. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will, there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. Revelation 21 and verse 4. Because the stone was rolled away 2,000 years ago, the stone of death and sorrow are rolled away today in our lives. Let us celebrate the Lord's resurrection for every debilitating curse has been broken and the enemy has been crushed. His head is under his feet and Jesus has risen from the dead. And today we do not, do not fight for victory. We fight in victory. Why? Because Jesus has triumphed over death, hell, and the grave. Rejoice, my friends. Let's all give praise and thanks to our risen Lord because the, the huge stone has been rolled away and every other small stone in our lives will be rolled away. How impossible and how intimidating it may be to us. The Lord is risen. He is risen to set us free. God bless you. Have a wonderful Easter and a, and the rest of the day and days to come. God bless you. Good morning and a blessed and a happy Resurrection Sunday to all of you. I want to welcome you to our 
special service today. It seems strange. It was just a year ago, 15 minutes into the service, I had to come and inform all of you that some bombs had gone off. And today we find ourselves in a similar predicament with the pandemic, locked us, locking us down in our homes. But the amazing thing about the kingdom of God is our God is not limited to a building. Our God is where his people are. So today, wherever you are, whether you're in a home, whether you're in a room, how you gather, just know that our God is with us. And as we partake in worship and listen to an amazing sermon today, let us celebrate our risen Lord and Savior. God bless you. Good God. morning, Bhattin Muller Church family. Thank you for joining us on our Sunday service as we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I pray that all of us will prepare our hearts to receive what the Lord has for us today. God bless you all and wishing everyone a happy Resurrection Sunday. Loving Resurrection Sunday greetings, Living Way family. On this Resurrection Sunday morning, as we gather online, due to the COVID-19 coronavirus situation. Let us remember that God is on the throne and in control. Let us appreciate afresh those who, with whom we are gathered in person, our families. And let us not despair because this is not wasted time but rather the start of a new season in Him. Happy Resurrection Sunday. God bless you so much. RC Tribe, good morning. I hope all of you are doing great. It's nice to connect with you once again. Welcome to our first ever online Resurrection Sunday celebration service. It's the Father's brilliant timing that the Jewish calendar and the church calendar have synchronized this year. Whilst the Jews are celebrating Passover, we Christians are celebrating the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's a unique season. I hope you'll be touched by the mega voltage of the resurrection power of our Lord Jesus Christ and be taken to a new dimension with him and be blessed this morning. RC. Very good morning and a warm welcome to our Foursquare family tuning into this very special Resurrection Sunday service. We invite you this morning to worship the Lord wherever you might be gathered. He is indeed in our midst when we gather in His name because He is not confined to that grave. He is risen. So we encourage you this morning. The Lord's victory over death and the grave is our victory over death and the grave. So let's just worship him in joy and thanksgiving this morning. Welcome everyone to the Four Square Church Resurrection Sunday service. I take this opportunity to welcome everyone from the Lifeway Church Nidambo and the Living Way Church Muratua. I hope all you guys have logged in and are ready to celebrate this wonderful service as we as one family Unite to celebrate Resurrection Sunday. Good morning uh, to the Living Way Columbus Three Congregation and to the Greater Living Way family. I want to welcome all of you to our Easter Sunday service, but I also want to welcome all of you who are watching, our friends and family uh, from across the world who are watching this live feed. I want to welcome you and I pray that this service would be a blessing to you and to your family. Uh, we are going to uh, go into a time of worship now with Suren. So let's just pray and commit this time to the Lord. Amen. Father, we come before your throne of grace and Lord, we just thank you. Now, Lord, even though we may be locked in and uh, shut up in our own homes, Father, nothing can keep us from your presence, Lord. And I thank you that we can join with our greater uh, body of Christ Lord even across this nation and across this city and across this world that we can all come together to, to glorify you and to worship you and celebrate uh, that amazing 
work on the cross and the resurrection of Jesus Christ that we celebrate today. Father, I pray that the worship time would be a blessed time, Lord. That, Lord, chains will be broken, oppression would be broken, that bondages would be broken, that depression would lift off, and, Lord, people would be set free, Lord. Even though we are in our own homes, you'll be set free, Lord, where we are. Father, we thank you that you are with us, and you said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. And, Lord, you're the God who can, who, whose kingdom, power, and rule, and reign will invade our homes. So I pray thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth in our homes as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name, Amen. Good morning everyone. Welcome to our Resurrection Sunday service. We'd like to wish you all a happy Easter. Will you join with me as we start this time of praise and worship?
that's what we're the doors.
love has a name. Love has a voice. Love has a name. Jesus, Jesus, your love is a light filling my eyes. Jesus, Jesus. Okay. 
family, I just want to remind you that at the end of this service, we will be partaking of communion. So I, I would uh, invite you to get ready with some bread and uh, juice at the end of the service, not right now. We're going to go into a prayer now uh, to pray for the country and for, the uh, for what's happening. But we're going to have communion and we'll give you at the end of the service, just before communion, we're going to give you about another one and minute, 20 seconds to get ready. So have uh, the, the juice and the bread ready uh, and we will guide you through the process. So uh, right now we're going to go and pray for the nation. Friends and church family, we are going to pray now for our nation. Uh, in Matthew chapter 17 verse 20, uh, Jesus tells us that uh, whatever we ask by faith, if we have faith the size of a mustard seed, that we could speak to a mountain and that it will be moved. And the scripture also tells us that when we have faith, nothing is impossible for us. So we are going to believe that God is going to come through. I'm going to read to you a scripture, a very important and significant scripture, taken from Matthew chapter 18, verses 18 to 20. Assuredly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you that if Two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. Today we are gathered together as one church. We are gathered together in spirit, agreeing, uniting in this prayer. And as we pray, Powerful things are going to happen. We need to believe this. We need to believe that nothing is impossible as we pray in unity. We have a lot, of, lot at stake here today. Our families, our businesses. But God is in control of everything. So I want you to bring all those worries and concerns that you have right now. And leave it at the feet of God. And we are going to agree 
and pray for we have a loving Father who loves us. And we have Jesus who intercedes on our behalf. And we have the power of the Holy Spirit moving all around us, able and ready to help us at this point of time. Let's agree and pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you as a church united in one spirit, in one accord. And Lord, we ask your help. We ask for your guidance. We ask for your wisdom. We ask for your protection for our nation, for each and every Christian living in Sri Lanka and each and every person living in Sri Lanka. And Lord, extending from Sri Lanka to the rest of the world, Lord, we ask your protection, your strength and your wisdom, O oh Lord, to battle this challenge of this coronavirus that has come in. Lord, we ask for your wisdom for our leaders, the president of this country, the health minister, and Lord, all the medical doctors and the forces that are uniting together, Lord, to battle this. Lord, we pray your wisdom, for it is only your wisdom that has the solution for this. And Lord, we just pray that they will be led by your direction. And Lord, we just pray that your protection will be upon them, Lord. Even as they do this, uh, their day-to-day uh, job, Lord, and in, in battling this disease, Lord, putting themselves at risk, Lord, the do doctors, the nurses, the forces, Lord, that are on the roads today, Lord, we ask your protection to cover them, Lord, and Lord, we ask your wisdom to be always around them. Lord, we just ask you, Lord, to, as we intercede for this entire uh, country, Lord, we just ask your grace to come through, Lord. We agree here on earth, Lord, and we bind. We agree and we bind this coronavirus and its spread in this nation. We bind it. We halt it in the name of Jesus. And we speak this by faith, believing that nothing is impossible for us because of the name of Jesus. And we exercise this name of Jesus and we take the authority that is there in the name of Jesus and we bind and we cast out this virus from our country and from this world, Lord. Lord, that this entire world will be healed. For Lord, 2,000 years ago, you paid this price, Lord, for our healing by the stripes you wore. And by those stripes, Lord, we are healed. And Lord, by those stripes, Lord, we are set free. And Lord, this price is paid and we receive this. And we receive your healing upon this nation. Forgive us, Lord. Forgive us for everything that we have done, O oh Lord, which is blasphemy and sinful in your sight as a nation, Lord. Forgive us. We, we, we ask in intercession, Lord, for all of the citizens of Sri Lanka. Forgive us, Lord. And Lord, set this nation free, Lord. We thank you for the power and authority that we have in the name of Jesus. We thank you for the prayer we have prayed is done in Jesus' name. For the answers to our prayer, your word says, is yes and amen in you. And Lord, we receive this and we receive this. And Lord, we are going to see it over the next few weeks, Lord. We are going to see your mighty power and your miraculous hand, Lord. Your Holy Spirit, Lord. The power of your Holy Spirit sweep through this nation, through this world. And Lord, that we will be free, Lord, from this disease. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. When I close my eyes, I, I can almost see you. A spectacle so consuming you wouldn't believe it. See, what I'm trying to tell you is not some story of a man named Jesus who died to save us. No. When I close my eyes, I can almost see you. A lamb whose body was broken and beaten. A lamb who silently went to be slaughtered. As I stood there thinking, why? Why would the Lamb have to endure this? After all, we did no wrong. 
I looked up and asked God, do you not see this? As they stood there wondering, questioning, seeing the body of the lamb beaten and taken away, I thought, I heard a voice say, behold the lamb of God and take it away, the sin of the earth. Then I remember the story, a story of a lion and the lamb, a story of who God's son was and is, but I did not understand this. How could Jesus be both the lion and the lamb? When I close my eyes, I can see it. The third day, a group of women, with all hope lost, defeated, run to the tomb. A tomb which they thought was a period, but which turned out to be a comma. I can almost see it. Lightning and thunder, the blaze, the radiance, the incandescence. Oh, my words, I can't describe it. The buried lamb now resurrected as the lion of Judah. I could see it. I could see it in his eyes. As his eyes met mine, it filled me with reverence, awe and power, knowing that the lion fought for me. His roar echoes his majesty. Seeing this, I found myself declaring blessing and honor and glory and power to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. I could see it, a love so amazing, though I did deserve it, given to us freely so that we might show this love to others who need it. Let's pray as we prepare our hearts to listen uh, to the Word of God. And also let's pray as we prepare our hearts to receive from the Lord's table, which we'll be doing at the end. Um, Father, we just come before your throne of grace, and Lord, we thank you once again that we can meet from across this city and across this nation and across the globe, Lord, in this day to celebrate no one but you, Lord. And therefore, Lord, I pray as I speak your word, anoint me, O God, Lord, to, to highlight and to magnify you, O God. I pray at the end of this service that people will leave knowing that they have encountered Jesus. And Father, I just thank you that you are a God who can visit them into their homes right now, Lord. And Lord, encounter them, Father, in the place where they are at, Lord, both physically and spiritually and emotionally, O oh God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Today I want to uh, see the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus Christ through the book of Revelation. In fact, to be more specific, Revelation chapter 5. Now, Revelation is a very good book for us to look at at times like this. Uh, in fact, I've had many inquiries about the book and about certain passages as people begin to look at what's happening across the globe and begin to understand something is happening and, and maybe it's dawning on people that we are truly at the end of time. Uh, so they've been asking me so, uh, several questions on that and it's a good book for many reasons. But another reason that Revelation is a very good book was that it was written in a very, very dark time in the history of the church. The church was a very, a very new in its in infancy. And at that time, persecution was tremendously strong against the church. The emperor of Rome was Domitian, and he was an exceptionally evil man, and he brought about a, a severe persecution on the church. And in fact, he had an edict that said, if you were a Christian, unless you renounce your God, there is a punishment. You can't escape punishment. And at this time, John, uh, the beloved apostle, was, was uh, on lockdown in the island of Patmos, which is a volcanic, a very desolate island. And uh, in this uh, a position of, of great suffering for himself and the church, uh, he sees a revelation, a series of revelations, which become to us the book of Revelation. In fact, the very first verse of Revelation, uh, chapter 1, verse 1 says, This is a revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave. So John is telling us something. This is not just a book of end times. This is not just a book of 
some t uh, events that are going to happen in the future. This is a book of, about Jesus Christ. It shows us Jesus Christ, a revelation of Christ, uh, that no other book in the Bible highlights Jesus or focuses on, on these aspects of Jesus like the book of Revelation. In fact, in the last couple of weeks, as we've been going through this very dark time uh, globally, one thing I've been doing is trying to encourage uh, the, the believers, trying to encourage people. I've been going into the Bible and, and looking at circumstances and situations where, where the men and women of God through the ages uh, struggled and faced challenges and how they overcame and how they were victorious. So, and and I, as I looked at it, I found a common thread. And one of the, we, I looked at, uh, for instance, David overcoming Goliath. I looked at how Je, uh, Jehoshaphat uh, defeated an overwhelmingly large army of three nations. I looked at how the disciples faced persecution and threats from the Sanhedrin and, and, and from Herod. And as I looked at these passages of scriptures, I understood one thing, one common feature in all of these passages was the view of the men and women of God, of their God, the view they had of God. It is this view that helped them to overcome. Likewise, in the very book of Revelation, one of the things that we see is how John, the revelation of Jesus Christ in the book of Revelation, helped John and the church overcome some of the worst persecution and opposition the church has ever faced. And they overcame. We know that because we are here today. The church is still here, regardless of the opposition, the darkness, and the evil that Satan threw at the church. We are here today in this little island here. Glorifying God is because the church in its infancy overcame. And they overcame because they had a right view of God. They had a revelation of God. In fact, Daniel. Uh, once again, speaking of end times and the, and the Antichrist and all these things in Daniel chapter 11 verse 32, he says this, the people who know their God shall be strong and carry out great exploits. The people who know their God shall be strong and carry out great exploits. So for those of us, I think it's time for us to take our eyes off everything else and focus on God because your view of God will determine how you will face this challenge and how you will overcome and therefore it's time that the modern church take its eyes off self-proclaimed prophets to take its eyes off superstar pastors and put its eyes firmly on Jesus Christ because he's our only hope church it's not a man it's not our hope does not come from any man no matter what title he bears our only hope is Jesus Christ. And that's why I've, I've constantly been saying this through this period, is that one of the songs that I've been listening to, and which has been kind of getting my heart to focus, is this, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face, and the things of this earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Well, I'm not going to sing the song for you, but those are the words. And I think those are such wonderful words because it basically says that as we look at Jesus, our, the darkest circumstances become dim. You know, right now we are highlighting all the things that are happening. It's time to highlight Jesus Christ. And no other day uh, suits that better than this Resurrection Sunday. So we're going to look at Revelation chapter 5. And in verse 1, it says, And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne, and that's God, because if you go back to Revelation chapter 4, we see that John is taken up into heaven, and he sees the glory of heaven, and he sees the glory of God sitting in the, on his throne. And now we come to chapter 5, and it focuses us on a little scroll. And it says, On his right hand was this little scroll with seven seals. This passage talks about a scroll in the hands of God. Now this scroll, I, I, we don't have time to get into all, all why I'm saying this, but uh, well, if you had time I could have, but uh, this scroll represents God's end time plan. This scroll represents God's plan of judgment and redemption on the world. That's what it, what it, what it talks about. 
And the fact that the scroll was sealed meant that what was written in the scroll could not be revealed. What was written in the scroll could not be carried out because it was sealed. And this was quite sad because that means that God's plan and purpose for humanity cannot happen the way God has planned and purposed it because the scroll is sealed. So therefore his plan of judgment on wickedness and sin and his plan to redeem mankind cannot be carried out. And it's at this point I want to point out something about God. When I talk about the scroll, I know some of you are probably going in your head, judgment and redemption are both those part of God's plan. And I want to tell you something about God. And God, and that's kind of a paradox, but I want you to understand something about God, that God is righteous and He's loving at the same time. You know, sometimes I, I remember as a child, I used to look at my parents when they used to punish me, I used to think, oh, they're not good parents. And when they are kind to me and do good things, oh, they're good parents. And, and, but God is not that way either. He's, he's always the same. He's righteous and loving at the same time. God is a God of justice and a God of mercy at the same time. You can't separate these two characteristics of God, one from the other. And guess what? You and I need God to be both righteous and loving. We need God to be a God of justice and a God of mercy. Sadly, many people cannot figure that out. Many people cannot comprehend that about God. They can't look at God's fierceness and His tenderness and bring them together and marry them. They can't see that. But I want to tell you, and that's why I want to kind of digress a bit to let us know that you can't step out of that. You can't split God down the middle. He's the same. He's righteous. He's a holy and righteous judge. And He's a loving and merciful Father at the same time. Listen, if God was just a, a holy and righteous judge, and if God was not a merciful and loving Father, you and I will not be here. We wouldn't be doing this live stream. You wouldn't be watching this live stream because we would be dust. You know why? Because God would have judged our sin. Because the Bible tells us very clearly in Romans 3.23, All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I don't know what you think of yourself, brother and sister. I don't know what you think of the, the, you know, the, the, the pastors and whatever. None of us is exempt of that. We have all sinned and fallen short of God's glory. In fact, Romans goes on to say there is no one righteous, not even one. So there is not one person on the face of this earth who has ever lived from the time Adam sinned to now, except for Jesus Christ, who is sinless. We've all fallen short, and we all deserve just one thing, is judgment. So anything that happens beyond that is God's blessing. It's God's mercy and God's grace upon our lives. You know, the problem is that too many people believe in man's goodness. Too many people believe and are somehow convinced that you and I deserve God's mercy. We deserve God's grace. Well, that's not what the, Bible, the picture the Bible gives us. When bad things happen, therefore, <coughs> we raise our hands to heaven and say, How could you, God? And other times... People just ignore God. They don't want anything to do with God. They tell God to go and pack his bags and get lost in a sense. But every time something bad happens, they raise their hands and say, How could you, God? What you need to understand is there's nothing good that we deserve. Nothing good except his fierce judgment. And that's why we need the loving and merciful Father. But at the same time, if God was only a loving and a merciful Father but not a holy and a just God. Let me tell you, COVID-19 will not be our greatest problem today. It will not be the globe's greatest challenge or problem of the day. In fact, mankind's evil and wickedness would have flooded the earth and wiped us out a long time ago. We would have destroyed ourselves if not for God's judgment and God's grace and love and all these things combined. Because that's the wickedness of God, of man. We would have, man we, if God just ignored that, we wouldn't be here today. Right through the Bible, church, you see the holiness of God and the love of God. You see the justice of God and the mercy of God. 
You go back right to the beginning when Adam sinned. When Adam and Eve sinned and disobeyed and rebelled against God. And when God comes down and He says, You have sinned and you have, you have done what I told you not to do. And then God pronounces judgment, the curse upon mankind and he tells Adam you're going back to dust Adam you're going to till the soil with the sweat of your brow and you're going back to dust he tells Eve you know you're going to labor in pain and all these things are going to happen and he, he curses uh, the serpent and says you, you eat dust and you go back to dust and at this point he speaks of mercy and he speaks of hope and love and a plan to save these sinful men when he tells us about the seed of the woman that's going to come to bring redemption and bring um, deliverance to mankind. If you go to Noah's flood, you see the same problem. Judgment. We see judgment in, in Noah's flood where God brought judgment upon the earth. But at the same time, we see his mercy. We see how God basically got Noah to build an ark. And remember that ark was not just meant for Noah and his family. It was meant for anyone who would repent. But the problem is they did. So you again, you see that God saved mankind through the ark. So there was, there was a way out. God provided a way out, his love and his mercy. If you look at the prophets of old, you see this in their message. There is sin in the camp. And God is going to judge that sin. And destruction is coming. But then it, the, the prophets turn around and says, but yeah, if you repent, if you turn to God, He will bless you and He will save you. You look at the cross, church, which we celebrated just a few days ago, what Jesus did on the cross. And if you look at that, you see that was a place God poured out His wrath in the most fiercest of way. Uh, uh, fiercest way. I don't think you can ever see the fierceness of God as he did when he poured out his wrath on his own son Jesus Christ. But at the same time, it is on the cross that you see the love of God, the mercy of God like you've never seen before. See, judgment and, and, and uh, love, um, uh, sorry, mercy and righteousness and love are two sides of the same coin. And this is God. You can't separate him down the middle. You can't take him and say, you know what? I want the loving and kind God and I don't want the other God. We can't do that. Because you and I need God to be righteous and loving. We need his justice and his mercy. We need a God who will not tolerate evil. But at the same time forgive those of us who have done evil. We need a God who will not tolerate a world that kills its unborn. A God who will not tolerate the use and abuse of children. A God who will not tolerate the powerful that exploits the weak and the poor. We, we need a God who will not ignore violence on the innocent and slaughter of the innocent. We need a God who will bring an end to evil and destruction. We need that God. But yet, we also need a God of love and mercy. A God who will find a way to, to, uh, to save sinners like us. We need a God who will make a way where there is no way. We need a God who will give us not what we deserve, but what we don't deserve. A God who will give us mercy and grace. The problem is we all probably all agree with this. But we want a God who will punish those who do evil but not punish us when we do evil. We want a God who will show grace and mercy to us when we do wrong things, but punish those who either oppose us or he don't like. Let me give you an example. You're sitting in a traffic uh, stop and you're watching the lights and it's still red and suddenly some guy like a maniac shoots past you and breaks the law. In your heart, you're thinking, I hope that guy gets caught by the police and justice is served. But what about the times that you were having to rush and the light was just about to, just changed and you realized, I can make it, and you broke the red light. And there's a police officer there. You're praying in your heart, I hope he doesn't catch me. Or even if he does, I hope he'll be lenient and show me mercy. Friends, we need, what we want is not the God of the Bible. What we want is a schizophrenic God. 
a God who is one thing one time and another thing another time. And that's not the God of the Bible. He's not a schizophrenic God. And let me tell you something. A schizophrenic God can't help you. We need a God who is both righteous and love, justice and mercy. Well, I know that there's a bit of a digression, but I, I believe some people need to hear that. So we come back to Revelations. And when you look at the book of Revelation, we see this, that John was taken into heaven and this mighty angel uh, shows him this little scroll in the hand of God. And then all of a sudden this angel cries out and he says, Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? And no one in heaven on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. Now, basically there was no one who was worthy. There was none who was both a righteous judge and a loving savior. There was none who was able to carry out both the plan of God uh, and of judgment and redemption. There was no one who could do both. There was not a conquering king and a sacrificial savior. There was no one on the face of this earth or even in heaven who matched that. And therefore, the Bible says John wept. He wept loudly because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside this. This basically meant the plans of God cannot be carried out. This meant that things had come to a dead stop. And no one was worthy to execute God's plan. And this brought great sorrow. Can you imagine? You're a prisoner on the island of Patmos, a volcanic island. The Romans are boiling you in oil. They're doing all kinds of evil things to you. And you just need a God to come as, and judge the evil, but at the same time, a savior to come and save you. And you need that God. And you can't find that. And there's no one worthy. John weeps. Can you imagine if COVID... 19 was here to stay and it's not going to change. There's no God who's going to come and bring a judgment upon the evil of this disease and save his people. What if there was no God? What if there was no hope? I'm sure. And we've had to be locked up forever. There will be great weeping and that's the weeping of John. But then the angel looks and says, don't weep. There is one who is worthy. Then one of the elders said to me, do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. And John already remembers. He knows the lion of the tribe of Judah. He's learned about this from his childhood. He knows that this is the king that Israel has always wanted and expected to come. And he is getting excited about this, this king who is to come. And he turns around to look. And it's really not a lion, but a lamb. It's not what he expected to see, a conquering king, a majestic warrior. But he turns around and it's a lamb. And not just a lamb, but a lamb that was slain. Uh, it goes on to say, Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing in the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. Friends, the lion is the lamb. John realizes the Lion of the tribe of Judah is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And he triumphed and he conquered through his death on the cross. He is the one that John used to call Rabbi. He is the one John said, he loves me. This is the one. He is the conquering king and he is the Lamb. He is both a Lion and a Lamb. And church, as I said before, we need him to be both these right now. We need him to be both these for, for the rest of our lives. Because when Adam and Eve, Eve, sorry, when Adam and Eve sinned, it created two problems. A usurped kingdom and a fallen humanity. The devil usurped the, God's kingdom rule over creation. That's why Jesus calls him the prince of the power of the air. And that's why Paul calls him the God of this age. And on the other hand, we have a fallen humanity. And that's why Isaiah 53, 6 says, All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. We have become sinful. We are bent towards sin. And we have lost dominion and rule. And we are being ruled. We have become slaves to Satan. And we have become sinful, lost in our sin. And God has two problems. He has to reclaim a usurped kingdom. And he has to redeem a fallen humanity. So what does he need? He needs a king. 
and he needs a savior. He needs a lion and he needs a lamb. He needs a king to take back the kingdom and he needs a lamb to save fallen humanity. So God puts a twofold plan, an action plan, a kingdom program and a redemptive program. And you can see this through the Bible. Now listen church, I want you to track with me. I know this is a little teachy, but listen, the end is good. So listen with me. Two prophetic promises. You see two prophetic promises. From the time uh, uh, Adam sinned, we, we, I mentioned this before, God pronounced a blessing and he says the seed of the woman is going to come and he's going to crush the head of the serpent and his heel is going to be bruised. So the crushing of the head is the kingdom program. It's through the crushing of Satan's headship that the kingdom is going to be restored because Colossians 2.15 says, when he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. And he did this through the cross, is the context of Colossians 2.15. But at the same time, his heel was bruised. And that's why Isaiah 53, 5 says, he was bruised for our iniquities, the redemptive program. We see two everlasting covenants. We have an Abrahamic covenant. In Genesis 22, verse 18, in your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. This is the redemptive program. God is saying through Abraham, God is going to bring redemption to all humanity. A blessing, is, uh, the curse is going to be reversed and blessing is going to come. But at the same time, there was another covenant. It was called the Davidic covenant. Genesis 49.10 says, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh comes, and to him shall be the obedience of the people. What's he talking about? The scepter is talking about a king who's going to come and the king's going to reign and this, through this, the line of David, God is going to raise up a king who's going to take back the kingdom. The kingdom program and the redemptive program. We see two promised sons. In the Abrahamic covenant, the redemptive covenant was a son Isaac who was to be sacrificed. But God said, no, I will provide for myself a sacrifice, a lamb that was going to be slain. The redemptive program. And under David was the son, promised son was Solomon. Who God said that your kingdom rule shall be forever. Your generations will live forever. Uh, will rule forever. And that is the king who will come and establish an everlasting kingdom. Two anointed officers. Did you know in the, in the Old Testament there were only two uh, officers that were mandatory anointing. And that was the office of a priest and the office of a king. The priest is the one who makes atonement for our sins, the redemptive program. And the king was the one who rules. We come into the New Testament when Jesus was born. There were two sets of visitors. The wise men came looking for whom? For a king. Matthew 2.2, 2, he says, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? What about the second set of visitors, the shepherds? Who did they come looking for? A savior, the Messiah. Luke 2.11 says, For there is born to you this day in the city of David a savior who is Christ the Lord. There are two New Testament callings. On the one hand, we are a royal priesthood. So the royal, the kingly priests. So we are kings and priests. Kingdom citizens called to proclaim the redemptive gospel. Two symbolic animals. We read that right in the beginning. The lion and the lamb. The lamb who makes atonement by being sacrificed. Behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Wow. And the lion. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah who has conquered, the root of David, who has prevailed. And Jesus Christ fulfills the king and the, and, the, uh, and the priest, the lion and the lamb, the kingly program, the kingdom program, and the redemptive program. He did it all. And that's why we need such a savior. That's why he is so important. That's why we need to take our eyes off every other thing and look at him because he is the one who is worthy 
He is the one who can conquer. He is the one who can enable us to rule and reign in this life. I hope you are seeing this. On the one side you will see a lion. And on the other side you will see a lamb. Now listen, I just want to tell you there are probably two pictures going up there right now. Of a lion and a lamb. And uh, when I said uh, I want you to see this. Um, those are, your eyes are not playing tricks. That's actually what we put up there. There is a lion and a lamb there. And I want you to see that. There's a lion and a lamb. He's the perfect savior. He's the only one worthy. We need a lion who's a lamb. We need a ruler over our circumstances to rule over what's happening right now. We need the grace and mercy of God, our savior, to save us. And I just want to do this last kind of thing before we wrap it up and I want to give you a picture of Revelations chapter 5 verse 7 to 10 it says then he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne and all the elders started to worship I want to set the stage here and I want you to think with me for a moment and listen I'm not just doing this out of the top of my head I'm doing this from scripture let me set the stage Jesus was slain he was crucified he was buried in a grave for three days he rose again on the third day, and now he has ascended into heaven. All of heaven is waiting. All of heaven throughout the generations have waited for this one moment. This moment when there would be that person who is worthy to open that scroll and begin the redemptive program of God. All of heaven is waiting. And that's why when Mary tried to hold on to Jesus, he said, Mary, you can't hold on to me. I must go back to the Father. What he's saying is, Mary, if I don't go back, this plan cannot be put into action. I have to go back and take that scroll and open that scroll, or there is no hope for you and the generations to come. Well, he's ascending into heaven now. There's an there's a, there's a angel, a retinue of angels that are accompanying him back into heaven. How do we know that? Because... I remember when, the, when he ascended, the, the, the disciples were looking up into heaven and there were two mighty angels who came and said, this Jesus you saw going up, he's going to come back the same way. And remember, he's going to come back with an angel army. So he's going back. The angels are escorting him back to his father's, father's throne. I want you to picture that. He's coming back and heaven hears him coming and heaven is excited. There's a palpable excitement and anticipation in heaven because the son is coming home. But not just the son, he's the victorious son who had been slain. He's the lamb that was, that was slain and the lamb who is alive again and he's coming back to heaven. And the angels are excited about this. I tell you, heaven was far more excited than some of us are when we, when we, when we even think about this. But here's the scene. The angels are crying out as they hear the Messiah approaching heaven's gates. They cry out and say, open up the ancient gates for the King of Glory to come in. And another group of angels, another heavenly response is, who is this King of Glory? And he shouts, the other first group shout out, he's the Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Friends, this is Psalm. This is from the Psalms. But remember, this Psalm was called an Ascension Psalm. It was a Psalm that the, the Holy, uh, the, the Ark of the Covenant was, uh, was taken into the Holy of Holies. But it was prophetically looking at this very moment. This very moment that John is seeing in Revelations chapter 5. The Son comes into the throne room. Our risen King and Redeemer enters the Father's presence. And he goes before the Father and takes the scroll in his hand. And heaven erupts in praise. Heaven erupts in worship. Why? Because one is worthy. All of eternity they have waited to unveil this plan. And now the only one who is worthy has come. And the Bible says the 24 elders fall down on their face. Each has a bowl and a harp in his hand. And they pray, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain and you have been redeemed. You have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nations and have made us kings and priests to God and we shall reign on earth. Why has heaven, why was heaven so happy and, re and joyful and rejoicing? Because God's plan is set into motion. Friends, we need 
this Savior. We need the Lion who is the Lamb. We need the righteous judge and the loving Father. We need a God of justice and a God of mercy. Or else there is no hope for mankind. There is no hope for us. We need Him because He is the one who rules and reigns in absolute sovereign dominion right now at this moment. His throne was never shaken. His plans were never shaken. He is where He wants to be and He is doing what He wants to do. And you know what? You and I need to know Him because it's those who know their God that will do great exploits. Friends, He has made us Listen to this. Listen to this. This is where it gets really exciting for me. He has made us kings and priests to rule and redeem. That's what he has made us. He is the king of kings and the lord of lords. He is the great high priest. But he's made us lions and lambs. And how do we know this? Because listen to this. We shall reign on earth is what Revelation 5 says. He is worthy to take the scroll, for He has redeemed us out of His blood, it says, and we shall reign on earth. He has made us kings and priests, and we shall reign on earth. You and I, therefore, are not called to simply be bystanders right now, church. We are not called to watch what COVID-19 is doing all over the globe, and, and bringing fear, and, 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 and anxiety, and death, and, and all these darkness from nation to nation, swallowing up nation to nation. You and I are not called to be bystanders. We are called to be kings and priests at this time. Church to rule and reign. God simply does not set a plan in motion and say, guys, just sit and watch because you have nothing to do in this. No, we are called to be part of His eternal plan. God's sovereignty does not excuse our responsibility. Revelation 5, 8 says the 24 elders fell down with harps and bowls. Friends, I want to tell you right now, we need harps and bowls. We need prayer and worship. We are going to overcome this viral epidemic, pandemic, whatever demic you want to call it. We are going to overcome not by spreading gossip and, and WhatsApp messages. We are going to overcome through prayer and worship. As we worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, as we pray and, and lay siege to the, whole, uh, the gates of hell, we are going to see these walls come down. That is our God. Why is that? Because He's a King and He's a Lamb. He's a Lion and He's a Lamb. He's a King and He's a Priest. This is not a time to fear. It's a time to rule. It's a time to reign. This is not a time to panic. Uh, it's a time to praise and it's a time to pray. God is preparing His church, friends. God is preparing His church to come out of our need-based orphan mentality of give me, I want, me, 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 to say, God, what do you want? What do the people want? Because I'm going to do something about it. Let me just tell you very quickly, church, I'm just fired up. And I'm not fired up just emotional hype. I'm not trying to get you all emotionally hyped. Believe me. I am fired up because this is the truth of the word of God. There is no other truth than this truth, friends. And that's what we need. You know, when we started this uh, pandemic or whatever, and people, shops are closed down and <coughs> resources are few, I began to panic. I'm telling you that. I began to panic. I started ordering of every page that you could order every um, um, online thing, whatever came to our complex, I would order and order. For the first time in my life, I ordered the groceries for our home. And to a point, Nirosha came and told me, listen, stop ordering. We have enough. Come and see. There's enough. We have more than what we need. I said, yeah, yeah, but the next week, it's not going to be there. And she said, listen, Ramesh, we have more than enough probably for the rest of the month, so calm down. And all of a sudden when I looked at all, he, she opened the fridge and she showed me, all of a sudden I realized I had an orphan mentality. I was trying to hold because I couldn't trust God for tomorrow, I couldn't trust God for the week to come and I was holding and holding. And I said, what are you doing with all these things? And I began to realize, what she was doing, she was distributing to our neighbors, she was distributing to the poor. Every time she would go somewhere, we'd go, get a chance to go and, and help somebody. She would say, can we give them so much money, and can we give them this, and can we give... And I'm thinking, if you give all that, what would we have? And I 
realize, church, our calling is not orphans. We are kings. We are priests. We are here to stand in the gap and bless people. We are here to pray. And listen, if you can't go out, we can't go out and do certain things, and that's okay. We can pray, and we can bless, we can call and encourage, we can give. Wow! God is preparing a church to worship through the darkness into the light. God is preparing a church for revival. That's what we are facing right now. This is exciting times. I am not down. I am excited because we are facing one of the greatest moments where God is saying, my sons and daughters, step on the stage. This is your time. Revival is at hand. And you need to shine now because when the darkness is darkest, the light shines the brightest. And you know what Jesus said? You are the light of the world. Hallelujah. Church, this is exciting. And that's why we need a lion and a lamb. And there's no other than Jesus who can provide that for us. So we are going to worship now. And we are going to worship with confidence and determination to do up, uh, you know, to, to lift up God and break through the darkness. And Trisha is going to come and lead us in a song. And you know, this song may be new to some of you. Some of you may know it. Uh, the words are coming up on the screen. Listen, listen to the words carefully and join in because it's a powerful song. It talks about him coming in the clouds. Kings and kingdoms will bow down and every chain will break as broken hearts declare his praise. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Hallelujah. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is a lion, the lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles and every knee will bow before you. Our God is a lamb, the lamb that was slain for the sin of the world. His blood breaks the chains and every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. Oh yes church, every knee will bow before him. And it says open up the gates. Remember what I was talking about? Make way before the king of kings. Our God who caused the saved is here to set the captives free. Who can stop the Lord Almighty right now? Those of you who are listening at the sound of my voice, I want to tell you as you worship God to this, chains are going to fall off. As you begin to worship God to this song and, and worship God with all your heart, you don't know the words, but let's just worship God with your own words in your home. The presence of God is going to come in and you're going to sense a tangible uh, presence of God in your home. Chains are going to come down. That heavy darkness that has been over you over these last couple of weeks is going to lift off as you begin to worship God. And because you know what? Your worship no more, your prayers no more are me-centered. But it is looking to the lion and the lamb. Friends, why am I excited? Why am I like this? Not because, you know, I have to drum up some excitement for you. No, church, that's on me. I'm excited because I've had a glimpse of the lion and the lamb. I've had a glimpse of the Lion of the tribe of Judah, and I've had a glimpse of the Lamb of God. And I tell you something, I can't be more excited right now. And I'm just waiting, because you know what, this, this curtain is going to lift, and you're going to see him more clearly. This heaviness and darkness is going to lift, and you're going to break into, the, into his presence. This, this uh, blockade or lockdown is going to lift, and God is going to use you to be a king and a priest, to rule and to proclaim him in this world and this nation. God bless you, church. Have an awesome, awesome, awesome uh, Easter uh, season. And not just Easter, awesome life on the whole. And we're going to partake of communion. We're going to have a song. Uh, Trisha is going to lead us, so please be there for that. Don't run away for that. I'm going to give you another one uh, minute, 20 seconds to prepare the cup and the and the bread, and we are going to partake together. God bless you, church. God bless you, bless you, bless you.
Well, we're going to partake of communion now. And once again, I've called my wife up here to help me with this, because uh, as you know, we're doing this on live um, uh, in our own bedroom. So um, it's, I'm not used to this, but let's, let's go ahead. Uh, 1 Corinthians 11.23 says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this, and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Church, this is the covenant that you and I are part of. All what I spoke before is yours because you're, part, you're a covenant child. Therefore, we are, going to, we are going to partake of the bread. So if you have your bread with you, I want you to bring that close. Okay? We are going to have, uh, we are going to have uh, a video go now. Okay? Uh, and I'm going to give you a few minutes to get ready with the, the bread and the cup. Okay, just one minute, 20 seconds, as I said before, and that video is going to go up now. Okay. Take the bread and we are going to partake as of one family in many locations. Jesus said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. We are going to partake together. So I'm going to give my wife. So you, I want you to give your family members around the room the bread and partake as a family together. And now take the cup. Jesus said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Take the cup and pass it around among your family and partake together. Okay, we are going to the, uh, our final closing prayer. God bless you. Thank you everyone for joining us today in a unique service, having six congregations plus our friends from different parts of the world. I pray that you have been blessed by what you've heard, to the worship, to the message, stirring message indeed. Just join me as we close in prayer. Gracious and loving Father, we want to fix our eyes on the victorious, risen King. You are the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And at this time, I pray, Father, for your church. 
I pray, Father, that there would be such a great spiritual awakening at this time across the nation and the world. Father, that you would bring us to a place where your people would draw unto you in intimacy, where people will know how much you love us, where people would know that through your love to know how to love others, not to be hoarders, not to lay up treasures where moth and rust will destroy, but to trust you and to be a blessing to others. Lord, I pray you would bring orphan spirit, a spirit of an orphan, where we think nobody loves us, nobody cares, so we have to just take care of ourselves. Remove the spirit of, of, of being a victim, a victim spirit. We are constantly looking, poor me, Lord, remove this. As we see the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, to see who is for us, to see who has called us, to see who has appointed us. As the word says, for he, Jesus, has made us kings and priests to our Father. Wow. And Lord, as we are kings and priests unto our God, help us to see the responsibility that we have. As always our people, help us to call in the church. So this is the time shine for light is risen over. Hallelujah. This is the time for the church to be the salt and to be the light. And therefore remove every spirit of fear. Remove the fear of the future. To know that you have a future secure in your hands. And therefore Lord fill us with hope. Fill us with boldness. Fill us with love. Hallelujah. We thank you, Father, that we will, we will know that you have our back. Not just us, but to the millions in our own nation and nations. Lord. Help us to be your love, Lord. To be your love. To love people as you have loved us. And now I pray you and keep you May he cause his fame to, to shine upon you and give you his peace. May he protect you from every plague and destruction. May he cause you to shine as the bright light where he has placed you. That you be a source of hope. The name of God does all the answer you.